So welcome everybody. Um, uh, as we said, we're going to talk about how to improve workplace collaboration and, uh, and transparency. Um, let me first introduce myself. Um, I am the Chief Product and Technology Officer at Stack Overflow. I manage a team that spans nearly every time zone across Americas and Europe. It was already 80% remote before the pandemic hit and is obviously now 100% remote. Um, so uh, that's that. Fortunately for us, we haven't had too much of a change uh, in the work habits, but we have had it in um, in, an, in with regards to what everyone's dealing with. Um, so uh, I've had over 20 years in the tech industry. Uh, I started at AOL uh, in the 90s and uh, have also spent time at WebMD, uh, namely, and just before Stack Overflow, which I joined in January. Before that, I was at uh, McKinsey New Ventures working on a product incubator. Outside of technology, my biggest passions are probably traveling and reading. Um, obviously, none of us are doing a lot of traveling right now, so uh, definitely been picking up the pace on uh, on reading uh, a lot of sci-fi and fantasy to uh, to sort of uh, a bit of escape. Okay, so let's dig into what we're going to talk about today. I'm talking about the true cost of distractions in the workplace and how you can improve collaboration and productivity while being aware and cautious of the impacts of interruptions. So at the end of the talk today, you'll, uh, you'll know the impact of distract distractions such as email, chat pings, and impromptu meetings, recommendations for reducing distraction and driving productivity, and three ways to improve company-wide or team-wide collaboration that both individual contributors and managers can implement. So first, focus is your most valuable resource. Let's talk about the underlying problems of distractions. You know, the technology that keeps us all connected has been around for over 20 years now, right? Instant messaging started uh, over 20 years ago, but it's grown more mature. And as any industry matures, it helps you solve the easy problems and creates efficient industry standard solutions that improve productivity for everyone. That leaves the hard problems to solve, the big breakthroughs, innovations that create the next set of opportunities for us all to work with. And growing into a mature space means tackling the hard problems that no one's been able to solve. And as you well know, solving those hard problems requires real focus, right? Uh, sustained focus and real attention. And the space and freedom to focus is what I believe your company's most valuable resource. Focus is being stolen from all of us every day. Your technology experts and other knowledge workers need uninterrupted focus in order to enter flow states, which is the mindset in which they bring their full suite of skills and experience to bear on the issue. As described in the book, Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience, by Mihai Cheek sent Mihai. Uh, being in this zone, this flow zone, uh, allows one to become fully engaged and focused on the task at hand. It leads to better results and great, greater happiness for the individuals. But it can only actually happen when you have the opportunity to fully focus on whatever lies before you. 47. 47 is the number of times the average person is likely to check his or her smartphone today, according to Deloitte's Global Mobile Sur uh, Consumer Survey. You know, I think it's interesting. I'll be really interested to see more data comes out after the pandemic, because I wonder if we're on the screen, the big screen more and the small screen less, but we're still getting uh, plenty of uh, uh, pings and, and whatnot to pull your attention away from whatever you're on. And just like our phone, our chat and messaging platforms at work, they're all taking away employees' valuable time and attention. And interestingly enough, is there's actually a biological incentive that only makes this worse for us. You actually get a dopamine reward cycle of constantly checking those messages or notifications and responding to them, right? I think it comes from a sense of like doing something. We all have a million things to do, but checking that message or looking at that notification feels like you've accomplished something, even if reality, it's not actually 
anything valuable that's a, a priority for you. So think about that. Six hours lost a day, okay? This is real. Um, there's actually a great, I think it's a New York Times article uh, that highlights this. Um, but another, you know, another common disruption for those in the office can simply be a tap on the shoulder. For technologists, they're thinking of a whole lot of things at once, solving problems that require a deep understanding of the whole system, the specific situation they're dealing with, and they're trying to keep lots of information in their brains all at once. And a simple real tap or a virtual tap right in the middle of their thinking process can be disastrous. These pings, dings, shoulder taps have a measured impact on your productivity. Research from the University of California and Humboldt University found that workers can lose up to 23 minutes on a task when they are interrupted. And researchers at UC Irvine observed office workers in their natural habitat uh, and found that on average, they switched tasks or were interrupted about every three minutes, okay? So if you're interrupted about every three minutes and on top of that, it, it could take you up to 20 minutes to get back to where you were when you were interrupted, they could cost individuals up to six hours every day. That's crazy. Uh, I, when I first read this, I was just in sort of disbelief, but they, they put out the numbers and, and show you how, how to get there. Okay, so uh, this is a great uh, cartoon about why you shouldn't interrupt a programmer. Um, and I think it sort of is a, a great visual demonstration of what we mentioned, of what I mentioned before, which is about like how deep into the rabbit hole or how deep into problem solving they are uh, and what happens when you then have to go and, um, you know, they have to go back and start all over again at the very beginning here, right? Um, so I thought, I thought you might enjoy that, uh, that visual representation. So you and your employees feel all these distractions and these interruptions. All these interruptions lead to greater stress and anxiety. Depending on the task, productivity may not suffer, but interruptions may actually cause us to work faster, right? So we feel more stressed, we're under greater time pressure. Uh, we feel frustrated that we never feel like we're actually getting the things that we want to get done completed. It takes more time and more effort to complete the same amount of work with interruptions in the mix. In the longer term, uh, enduring uh, regular interruptions, which can be up to 85 a day, can definitely cause decreased job satisfaction and burnout. And I think a lot of us are feeling that right now, even if we're not in person. Knowledge workers who are interrupted in a counterproductive manner are significantly more stressed. They have higher levels of stress, frustration, mental effort, feelings of time pressure and mental workload. And that's from a Fast Company article if you wanna dig in uh, a little bit more. Stress and anxiety form a feedback loop which can cause attentional problems like difficulty concentrating, right? Uh, without the ability to focus on what you're working on, you may forget steps or not remember solutions you've already found, right? Uh, anxiety has been linked to memory lapses. And if you're constantly forgetting the information you're received from chat messages that interrupt people, you may end up having to interrupt them over and over again to try and get that answer again. You also may be more likely to through skipping steps and actually cause problems uh, just because you're so distracted and stressed. And companies keep giving us more opportunities for distraction, right? Instant messaging, video, uh, chats have raised significant amounts of capital as uh, recently as investors expect the number of employees working outside our main offices will be sustained or continue to rise. Last year, Zoom and Slack went public, which reinforced the view that the market for business communication is growing. Data provided by PitchBook Data Inc. shows that in each of the last four years, there were more than 100 financing rounds, specifically on the enterprise communication software business. Enterprise collaboration as well as communication software continue to go at a rapid pace. The chart shows investments in 2017 at 3.3, 2018 at 5.7, and 2019 at 6.2 billion. Okay, so now we know 
what's happening and is unlikely to change anytime soon. So how do we balance uh, the continued and increase in disruptions and software that tries to pull our attention away? Well, we know that the need for collaboration and meaningful communication is required for teams and for the whole organization to be successful. And especially with remote work, how do we balance it all? The promising market, the investment for tools and the flexibility to work just about anywhere is where we actually are today. Uh, in fact, Stack Overflow, as I mentioned before, started as a remote work uh, culture. Uh, and before this 50% of our, uh, the whole company, and like I said, over 80% of uh, the uh, engineering and product organization were working from their home office or in various places all over the world. Um, and it allows uh, companies who have this remote work culture to attract and retain talent, regardless of where their geographic region is. And with, these, with the right tools, we can help communication and connectivity. Um, however, we're seeing all these interruptions left and right. So let's look at the problem a different way. What really makes us miserable is actually uh, uh, what makes us miserable about these constant interruptions is it actually destroys our control, right? Our focus is no longer under our control or our command. Instead, it ends up being at the mercy of notification on top of notification on top of notification. Multiple applications chiming, uh, crying out for our attention and wrangling, wrangling them under your control seems to be at the root of the solution. Our always on culture means that work contacts don't stay within the bounds of the workplace or the work time zones, especially in remote and work from home situation. It becomes all too easy to answer Slack or emails after hours, right? So we're all in meetings all day. And when we actually get the time to focus and provide answers, we're now creating notifications to our colleagues um, to, and they feel uh, uh, that they have to respond, right? So freeing up just what's supposed to be your free time is, um, is like the very least, the bare, bare minimum that we feel like we, we need to be able to do. So how can organizations offer industry leading tools and technology to improve collaboration while keeping employees productive and try and remove as much stress as we can? So how do we fix it? by giving your employees or yourself the ability to recover some measure of control over the focus of their week, right? So first I'll cover some ways to guarantee you and your team teammates can get work done to drive business results. There's a couple I'd like to highlight for you. Agree on universal do not disturb hours. Block out time that you and your teammates are not available and share these with key groups you work with. This usually works best from the bottom up. Who are the teams that work together with their time zones and other sort of constraints? How can they, um, how, how can they work together and create something that they can agree on and then socialize it with other key groups they work with? Another item that uh, I believe can really help is picking one must do item for yourself and sharing it with your teammates, right? Picking one, and this isn't like a small item on your to-do list, but a real focus for the week. One problem that you're really trying to solve uh, and make progress on. Um, it may be uncomfortable to try and pick just one, but it helps keep you focused. If you constantly get distracted, you can say, "Is this does this contribute to the, my must-do item for this week? Uh, we've also, I've also recommended posting this as your Slack notification. So not only are you holding yourself accountable, but you can ask your teammates uh, to help hold you accountable for this. Maybe it's on your calendar or any other tool that you have to really socialize and put this out to the rest of uh, your colleagues and teammates. And lastly, know the end goal. It's really important for you to, to and your team to be focused on what are the KPIs or business goals or outcome for the project that you're all working on together. If something distracts you, again, in holding each other and yourself accountable, you can say, does, does this work help get us to the end goal? If not, you work to uh, deprioritize it. Second, I wanna focus on building a collaborative culture. 
We know the benefits from collaboration are significant, right? But what are the actual risks if you don't have a collaborative culture? According to the Project Management Institute, 57% of failed projects have to do with ineffective communication. That's a lot, right? 57% of failed projects, one of the ma major uh, contributors to the failure was ineffective communication. So by building a collaborative culture, everyone benefits. Everyone feels like their work matters, they have meaning and they have purpose. Deloitte's May 2020 article, Belonging, From Comfort to Connection to Contribution, states that people are looking for work to give them a sense of personal fulfillment and satisfaction. And these things are driven from a sense of uh, wanting to belong. Belonging encompasses feeling, feeling comfortable at work, which means being treated fairly and being respected by others feeling connected to their teammates and their colleagues, and that their contributions are, values, seeing how, are valued, seeing how their strengths are helping the organization achieve bigger common goals. Belonging leads to collaboration, and collaboration leads to a higher chance of success because people are comfortable, connected, and have real obvious ways that their contributions are valued and have impact. So what are the roles that, or what are the steps that we can take to get there? First, have clarity around roles, responsibility, and mission. Having everyone on the same page about roles or who does what on a project can help avoid communication pitfalls and, and uh, failed projects. Clarity around the roles and the responsibilities helps minimize constant questions or impromptu meetings to determine who owns something or who's, uh, who's got it first, who's handing it off, or to have to impromptu develop a one-off process for that specific project to help get things moving again. Ensuring there's little overlap or responsibilities, a clear process, and the ultimate goal, or what I like to call success criteria, is really important. So then how does this ladder up? to the larger organization? Well, you need to have a set of strategic initiatives across your organization to help enforce clarity. For example, at Stack Overflow, we have five strategic initiatives or goals we set out for 2020. And we literally just had a, uh, the beginning of a company-wide meetup where we actually started with the five new strategic initiatives for next year that helps us go into planning and coming up with what are the, um, what are the specific projects, roadmaps that all come back to those uh, strategic initiatives and the business outcomes associated with them. So next, uh, we talk about buy-in and psychological safety. Everyone, this comes back to control, right? Everyone wants autonomy in their role. They want to have control over how they work. They want to feel like they have the ability to speak up when they have new ideas or innovative solutions to bring to the table. We need to ensure employees feel trust and confidence to build the psychological safety they need to express new ideas, suggest new ways of thinking, and to build the relationships they need to solve the complex problems we're all facing every day. A safe environment in which an employee can speak up with their ideas or solutions leads to more productive collaboration time. This re results into less one-on-one -on -one or intimate brainstorming session that can eat into your day or your working blocks. It allows people to compose their thoughts or ideas uh, before they present them without fear of interruption or immediate challenge. And it also allows uh, us to have more asynchronous collaboration. We all know th that in-person live is not the only way to collaborate. Research from Google showed that a well-organized team that collaborated and, uh, an individual, and had individuals on the team who felt psychologically safe uh, were much more productive and impactful. It reduces the possibility of leaving the company, it reduces the possibility of the individuals on the team leaving the company, increases the likelihood of using diverse ideas or solutions. It helps bring in more revenue 
and the teams tend to be twice as effective as others in actually getting their job done. Equip employees with just the right amount of information. Um, I think uh, I think as a someone in a manager or leadership role, you know that, right? Um, employees can only take so much in information as well as interruption. And we already know what the cost of distraction is. People need to work longer periods of uninterrupted time to do their best work. So as a leader or manager, what you really wanna do is make sure that people have the right amount of information to, uh, and to, to do the role that they need to, to give them that autonomy and that control. Um, but not so much that they're overwhelmed and they can't sort through all the information they have to try and get the information that's really relevant to the project or the problem that they're working on. So how can we implement these ideas as, you know, if you're an individual contributor? Well, you know, clarity around roles, responsibilities, and missions. Ask for it. Ask for clarity, offer clarity to others start having conversations, right? I think it's really important when you uh, start a new team or when you start to, um, you, maybe you have growth and you have to split into smaller teams like in, in product development roles and you need to clearly carve out what that team has ownership for, what they're responsible for, what kind of decisions they have autonomy to make within the team without having to go up or outside to get buy-in, um, and I think that's really important, right? Um, and so, you know, you can start even as an individual within your team. Here's what I'm focused on, right? What are you focusing on? Start small, but you can extend that from yourself within the team for your team with, with other sort of adjacent teams to try and establish that. Um, and I think it's really important at the end of meetings or collaboration sessions that you sort of really clarify ownership and next steps, right? So Beth, you're taking on, you know, the, the first action item, you know, when are you gonna come back to us with an update or when do you think you're gonna be finished? Just asking those questions helps um, create more clarity around others, which means you don't have to have lots of follow-up sessions or uh, interruptions to try and get that information after the fact. Um, Buy-in and psychological safety, Agree with your teammates that you'll all be open to each other's ideas. Give each other the space and time to compose their thoughts or responses. And it benefits everyone, not just a few individuals. We all think differently. We all work and communicate differently. And so, you know, agreeing, you know, to bet that we're assuming best intent, agreeing that if someone asks for a little more time or space to give it to them is really important in sort of that creating that psychological safety. You know, add a call out on a document at the start of the meeting or within a discussion thread, right? That says very openly and very clearly, collaboration space, all ideas, thoughts, and perspectives are welcome. You can also establish a, a tone for written uh, communication. So there, there's one person here uh, that I work with a lot at Stack Overflow. And uh, she calls out, whether it's verbally or in a document, that she's going to poke at someone's uh, idea when she's going to challenge them in a constructive way. Her calling out that poke uh, is meant to be an indicator that there's no malicious intent in her challenge. She's just trying to open up to discuss around the idea to understand, you know, any the strikes or any gaps or weaknesses in it so that everyone really understands it and that we've really explored uh, any idea to make sure that we're that everyone's on the same page. So to recap, there's real productivity costs to losing focus and it's a major impact to everyone's well-being and our level of stress. You can protect your team's focus on a daily basis by agreeing to universal do not disturb hours, picking one must do a week and sharing it widely and making sure that everyone on the team knows what the end goal, they know what success looks like. And you can implement company-wide or team-wide approaches for focusing on, uh, for improving focus and collaboration, such as clarity around roles and responsibilities, buy-in and psychological safety for your team and work environment, and making sure that 
members of the team have just the right amount of information to be able to uh, have autonomy, uh, but not so much that they're overloaded. So uh, that's that's the talk. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. I think we have some time. Uh, I'm happy to take questions uh, if uh, if you have any or um, want to reach out uh, asynchronously as well. Yeah, thank you, Teresa. I think there are some questions on the Q and A. Do you want to look at them, or I should read them off? Uh, if you want to read them to me, that would be great. Okay, fine. So uh, the first question is, uh, did much of your research come across, uh, and um, you may have touched on this, but I had to step away. So okay, do much of your research come across meetings versus should have been an email? Yeah, I think um, we didn't focus on it when we were doing the research for, uh, for this specific talk. But, um, you know, it's something that, you know, in multiple organizations that I've joined before, uh, one of the sort of conversations that we often have is, um, you know, what I call meeting culture. And I think it's, you know, it comes back to the larger distraction, right, that we keep talking about. Um, but, you know, what I, I think, you know, what's really important is, is to come up with a meeting culture, right? And that can be everywhere from like, you know, uh, I once did one that was sort of a decision flow chart, right? What are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to get everyone on the same page? Are you trying to inform them? Are you trying to make a decision, right? Are you trying to get a group of people to commit to a plan, right? And then as a result of that, you have suggestions about what you should do. Um, like how, like, okay, now you know what your end goal is. And how should you how should you put together a plan, you know, to optimize for people's time, and also to make sure when you have a meeting they're really engaged and that people come prepared, right? So should there be agenda beforehand? Should there be pre work rather than the pre work actually happening live in the meeting where not everyone needs to be there for it? And so I think there's a lot of things that we can do, but I really like you know, helping in, in helping to answer that, you know, I think we've all seen that, like we've all talked about, you know, walking away from meetings that we all were like, yep, should have been an email. <laughs> um, and so I think thinking about it from a larger standpoint of like, what is our team organization or company um, meeting culture? And what, like, what are the questions that someone should ask themselves to decide, should this be an email? Should this be a collaboration document? you know, um, should this be, should this be a meeting? Should this be a series of meetings? Um, I think is really important. And I think it's really Im important to develop that meeting culture together. One, so that people understand it, different points of view are reflected and folks feel ownership and therefore hold each other to whatever you agree to. Okay, thanks for that answer, Teresa. So um, the next question from Rebecca, she says, um, the largest destruction um, when working in, a, in the office is the open, open workspace. The visual distractions are nearly constant. I can't turn off or limit the people sitting or working near my desk. How do you suggest we focus and produce in these open workspace environments? I think it's a huge challenge. And, you know, uh, I have lots of uh, friends and colleagues in, in the tech leadership space, and we talk about it all the time, right? There's all these articles written why open workspace is not ideal. Uh, it's not ideal for, for this focus and everything. Um, and I, I'd make a couple comments here. One, I think at the very least, you know, noise canceling headphones, putting on bigger headphones. Um, what I've seen is it's real visual indicator to folks that you're focused and a bit heads down. And I've seen people be more reluctant to come in and, um, and, and sort of do the tap on the shoulder uh, to, to try and interrupt you. Um, I've seen folks use sort of like uh, uh, some sort of visual indicator, maybe different colored cards that they put up uh, to sort of show when they're sort of heads down in the work versus like, you know, maybe just answering emails or chatting or doing something that's more uh, disruption friendly. Um, but, but overall, what I'd say is, 
I'm really interested, right? I think in the tech space, a lot of companies are looking at going, you know, virtual, more, more remote sort of permanent or um, much more supportive of remote work environments. Uh, and, um, and I'm really interested to see what's going to happen for workplace environments, like how it's going to evolve as we start to maybe start to tear out cubicles and, um, and rearrange these sad, more flex spaces uh, and whatnot. And my hope is that maybe some of the sort of ingrained, like we always have cubicles and everything um, could really be helpful. I think, you know, the visual distractions, uh, higher cubicles are better to try and not have that um, to Rebecca's comment on there as you can see them, right? You can, you can see them out of the corner of your eye or you can see them making eye, contract, uh, eye contact down the, down the uh, row. Um, and, you know, all I can say is that I really do hope that as a result of what's going on with, you know, the pandemic and so many people working remotely is we start to really rethink office space. Oh, thanks for that answer, Teresa. So um, the next one is, so two persons are asking um, where, if you could share your slides or is there a link where they can access your slides? Yep, so we'll, we'll, uh, I'll work with um, my team and figure out how we can share those with you all. Okay, so um, the next question from Troy, uh, how do you establish universal D and D when different time zones are present? Yeah, I think, you know, like I said in, in the talk, um, I think it has to be from the ground up, right? So we have teams that have um, uh, various time zones, right? Spread across within a scrum team. And so, you know, the answer may be that you agree, you know, if you really do have a wide breadth of time zones, the answer may be, okay, you actually sort of do the inverse, which is you sort of say, these are the times that we're gonna be available to each other where we have the most overlap. And then individuals um, on the team then say, okay, if those are the three or four hours that we're really reserving to have meetings and collaboration and whatnot. Now, outside of those three or four hours, where can I create my own do not disturb, um, you know, hours for myself, right? And advertise those out. Um, I think what's important with the D&D &D is sort of how do you block it on your calendar? How do you get people to respect to not send you meeting invites there? Um, and also how do you, you know, turn off notifications on Slack uh, for that? So I think, um, I think it really has to come from the bottom up. I think declaring it whether you've seen, you know, no meeting days or this or that, I, I feel like from the top down, it, it isn't all that helpful other than to say that we should all have these and to protect these. And if you feel like you, you, you know, you've worked to, to ensure that the folks around you have access, you know, have access to you on a, on a regular basis and have ways to communicate with you and people still aren't doing it, then you should, you know, then you should look for leadership to help make sure that everyone respects those boundaries. All right, thanks, Teresa, for that answer. So um, the next question from Mike says, how many productivity tools are too many? I work in an environment where vendors, teams, etc., all have their own. There's not a single source. No one will budge. What would you recommend as the best two or three to plan the work around? Yeah, I think this is problem and, and sort of like to the opposite uh, question uh, that you had that that I or answer that I just gave to the question above this. I actually think it has to come from the top down. Um, you know, you have to sort of rein in how many productivity tools that you have, right? And I think that you know you need to go to you need to be able to go to leadership and say you know because there's really two impacts on your uh, on an organization when you have too many productivity tools, right? One. You're not getting transparency. You're not getting a lot of the value of having these collaboration or productivity tools. You're not actually getting to experience them because you don't even know where to find the information that you need, right? Which is the goal. A goal with many of these tools is actually to try and reduce how many places you need to go to find an answer. Um, 
And secondly, it ends up costing your company a lot of money because a team, you know, to your point, in this case, it may be an adjacent team that's using um, a, a different tool. And for you to get access to their information, they now have to pay, uh, pay for a seat for you or a license, right? And that, and that really adds up. And so I think, you know, I, I look at one of my roles as sort of in technology leadership is to keep those in control, right? And say, here are the different needs, use cases that our organization has, right? And for the main types of productivity tools, how do we, you know, what are, what are the real needs that we have? How do we evaluate them and select one and implement it widely with good integrations to really help drive, you know, adoption and engagement in it. And if some team comes along, so for example, we're, let's say we're using Zoom and a team comes along and says, we want blue jeans, right? I think leadership response for the primary productivity tools has to be like, well, what's missing on, in this case, Zoom? What's missing on the current productivity tool that's supposed to solve this use case? And is there a use case we missed or has it changed or evolved, right? And sort of make a decision as a company, do we add another one into this? And so I think, um, you know, it, it, you really have to go to leadership and help them understand what having all of these tools and all of these ways for you to be disrupted or all the places you have to look for knowledge or information or answers and help them understand the impact that's, have, that's having on all of you and maybe ask for a more concerted, organized effort to come up with the primary ones. Now, there's always going to be teams that need additional tools that are for their use case, but for the real foundational ones, I think you really need to limit them to a handful and tightly integrate them to get the most benefit. Uh, thanks, Teresa. Uh, so the next question is um, from Kevin. It says, a lot of this requires emotional labor on the part of the team members. How do we keep from placing an underdue burden or in the women of the team or company, since often this label is offloaded to those members of the team? That's a great question, Kevin. And first of all, can I just give you kudos for even, you know, thinking about that and having that point of view? I would say since I started working in, in technology 20 years ago, uh, we've, come, we've come a long way. We've still got more to go, but just the fact that you're even thinking about this is, uh, is really important. And I would say like, you know, as an individual, like who's aware of this, as, as you obviously are, um, I think it's, you know, it start by just saying it out loud, right? Saying, right, how do we make sure that this, you know, this emotional labor is distributed across those of us, right? Different types of emotional labor that's required here um, is, uh, is sort of di distributed by the folks who have certain strengths or interests in, uh, in working on this. You know, it's just like I always say to a lot of my um, my male colleagues are um, if you if you see something that's sort of unfair uh, due to whatever reason to a, a specific group in the team, someone who's in the group uh, of the majority speaking up, calling it out and talking about it goes a huge way um, towards making it than someone of that you know, underrepresented or minority group in the team sort of trying to stand up for themselves. So I would say I, I would start with just, you know, saying it out loud, acknowledging it, and then trying to be really thoughtful as you plan out how you implement this work. Thanks, Teresa. Um, so the next question is, is really actually very important to me too. So, um, so do you have any recommendations on how to better manage interruptions from tools like Slack? I mean, it's hard, right? Um, I would say a couple recommendations I would say is like, use your do not disturb on Slack. Don't feel like, you know, don't set people up to expect that you will respond to a Slack message day or night. Um, also, like, you know, one personal thing that I use, my operating model that I, I share with people uh, when, when they first start working with me um, is actually to, to say, if you have a question, reach out to me in Slack. If you actually need me to take an action, 
right? If you need me to do something, follow up on something, please, um, please like send me an email because I'm not like, like Slack is not where I manage all of the work that I have to do and what I need to do. And if you Slack me asking me to take an action on something, it's unlikely, it is, well, it's likely that it'll get missed because I'll read the Slack message and then the notification will go away and I won't remember to come back to it. And how I like work to train folks is actually that when they actually do Slack me with that, I'll respond to them and go, can you please send this request to me in an email, right? So I can manage it and prioritize it um, appropriately. So I think some of it's just training folks and setting expectations. I always say that um, a huge amount of my my job day to day is managing expectations and um, and and building context. And I think in this case, giving that context of how I use Slack and how it works for me versus how I use email is important. And also setting expectations. Uh, with the team of like what hours I'm going to be less likely to be available. We have, you know, a lot of like away from keyboard messages on and team um, Slack groups uh, where folks say I'm away from keyboard for an hour, right? I'm making lunch. I'm going for a walk. I'm working out, right? Um, I'm helping my my child with their homeschooling or whatnot. Um, and so really, you know, saying that out loud, letting people know when you're done for the day in those groups. So I think really about managing expectations of your team can be really helpful there. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. So I, I usually make this joke and I'll be like, what, what if um, Slack had a, a function where you could see that someone has read your message and hasn't replied? <laughs> And people will just find a workaround around it like they do on, uh, you know, on, on iMessage and whatnot, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, the next question is, okay, reality for a lot of us is we are a small team and have to be available for emergencies when they arise. While working across the country and having different work times, even on the same team. So while I want to, uh, I want the team to have a dedicated work time. If we, if we do need to address an emergency or a, a emergency chat or email, how do you suggest we, we filter those through while keeping the more general informational notifications quiet? That's a great question, right? I think um, you know all of these situations assume certain ideal scenarios, and that's not actually how we all work, right? I think one to come back to expectation management, which you know my team thinks I come back to uh, a lot, um, but it would be agreeing with a group of what is an emergency because I think it becomes if you if you um, everything because if the best way to get a hold of people is by declaring an emergency, then uh, everything becomes an emergency, right? So I think you know I would say start with what is an emergency? What is it? What is the sort of impact or risk? or sort of what are the clarifying characteristics that say this is an emergency? And then maybe it's a different Slack channel that you have or a different way, right? A group text message, maybe it's something else that you, you use in those true emergencies, right? To convene people, to, to notify them and convene them um, to work through that. I, I would say, you know, bring it up with your team and ask, right? You know, we all want to have more focused time and less interruptions, you know, how do we define what an emergency is and what's the best way to denote an emergency versus all the other sort of, you know, background noise that in discussion that happens within a team. Question is, uh, I work with a lot of people who are used to having a meeting to discuss the schedule for a meeting. How do I convince them that just an email would be fine? Yeah, I think this comes back to what I said earlier. I said, I think you have to get the group to come together and figure out what that meeting culture is, right? What is the, what is the meeting culture that you want to have? What is the right time to have a meeting? Um, and it takes effort, right? Behavior changing is a lot of work. But I think first what you have to do is get buy-in, one, that it is a problem, that we're wasting folks time by, uh, you know, by having unnecessary meetings, right? Um, and uh, so step one, acknowledge there's a problem, right? 
step two, get everybody's you know, input and opinions on how we can improve the situation, right? What are the steps, decision-making um, that we can have to do this, you know? then get everyone to buy into this and then to hold each other accountable, make it very visible, right? Make it a part of a meeting planning process that you have to put in the meeting. You know, here's the agenda. Here's what, you know, the outcome of this, the, you know, the intended outcome of this meeting is going to be to try and get folks through there. And I think that wraps up my time, right? <laughs> I think that came out just perfect. Yeah, so I, I think you have that just one minute. So there's one more question you could okay. take answer in one minute. So um, how do you best encourage participation in meetings from those who are naturally quiet or need more time to process information? So for the naturally quiet, I feel like um, that's not me, as you can probably tell. Uh, I'm actually an, an extrovert in technology, uh, which tends to be more unusual. Um, so I think then those of us who are the extroverts who tend to lean into the conversations um, need to ask other people's opinion. We need to pay attention and ask folks uh, who are more naturally quiet or haven't sort of spoken up, what do they think, right? Uh, any concerns they have, right? Um, I think we have to ask, right? And then making a psychologically safe place, we sort of need to make space for them if they don't feel like there's already space from them or for them, or they're not already naturally inclined. Um, I think when, uh, when it comes to needing more time to process, I think you need to ask that. Like, our, you know, if we're trying to make a decision or whatnot, we need to say, um, are we ready for, are we ready for, to make that decision or do we need to go gather information or do people need to do some analysis, right, on this and ask those questions rather than just assume that everyone's ready to go forward. And I think that comes back to the psychologically safe place that we all think and work and solve problems slightly differently from each other.